So we're, we're doing something, right? I guess so, yeah. moderating so I'm just gonna get get started uh, thanks everyone for coming I know it's early and apparently the attendance shows that uh, my name is Micah Abbott I'm a senior quality engineer at Red Hat I work on the Red Hat atomic host product and the Red Hat core OS product uh, I'm here to talk about why quality is everyone's job um, I'll give a quick disclaimer though when I proposed my abstract I had a idea of what I wanted to talk about in terms of quality is everyone's job but when I just developed the slides it transformed more into building uh, how to build a culture around that how to build a team that that respects that uh, so I will still touch upon what how quality is everyone's job but there might not be as much focus uh, as I planned so first some bad news uh, I'm not an expert in this uh, there's probably people who can speak to this more uh, intelligently and profoundly. Um, none of the advice I'm going to give is particularly novel. Uh, if you were to Google some software development practices and quality practices, you could probably come up with a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you about. I'm also really bad at following my own advice, so there's lots of things I haven't put into practice in my own day-to-day -day job, my own organization. Um, and there's no guarantee that any advice I'm going to give you is going to work for your team. Uh, software development, especially quality, is really complicated and 
it really you really have to know your own team to figure out what's going to work, what's not going to work. But I do have good news. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, so I have what I think is a good amount of experience to make some observations, give some opinions on the matter. I am ISTQB certified. For those of you who don't know what ISTQB is, it's the Inter International Software Testing Qualification Board. They're trying to promote uh, standardized QE practices and best values. Uh, I went through their foundation level course, passed their test, got the certification. Uh, I've been participating in Agile, an Agile team for almost four years now. Um, this talk will be pretty heavy on the Agile methodology uh, down the line. Uh, I'm a big fan of it, having lived both sides of Agile and other ways of doing development. And I've got a psychology degree, and the only reason I mention that is because a lot of what I'm going to talk about is building teams, how to form relationships within teams, and I think the background in psychology really is helpful in navigating those waters. So first I'm going to talk about how we did QE in the past. I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with the waterfall model. Uh, it looks like this. You've got uh, requirements that are made that fall down in design, implementation, verification, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of problems with this model, in my opinion, and I'm going to start going through them. Um, number one, you, you end up with multiple silos of responsibility, uh, like product management, development, quality assurance. Uh, everyone tends to own that their little piece of work and doesn't necessarily pay attention to what other people are doing uh, in the whole chain. And sometimes that generates silos when silos. For example, you sometimes end up in a quality organization where one team is doing test automation development and then the other team is doing the execution and they might not even be communicating very well or communicating outside of that, that larger silo. Uh, like I said before, everyone tends to stay in their own lane. They own their piece of work until they get to the end and then they pitch it off to the next group and then the next group has to deal with whatever output was given, was generated. Uh, and it doesn't really encourage communication between the groups. You, Like I said, when you are so uh, singularly focused on your output, you aren't really going back up the, the chain to talk about how they did something, what they did, or getting involved in that process earlier on. Uh, and the, the one thing I noticed in these models explicitly missing from it are groups like support and documentation. There's no box on that, that chain that says, you know, support should be providing input here. Unless you have like a really good product manager or program, program manager who might be pulling people in like that, uh, typically support and documentation are uh, those, and those types of organizations are left out of the discussion. Um, when we're owning the own, the, when each stage is, when the output of each stage is owned by a certain group, any mistakes are then just passed on to the next group. And this encourages things like throwing code over the wall, which you end up, like, I'm sure you, maybe you've seen Monty Python where the code comes over the wall, QE has to take it, and oftentimes you end up in a situation like this where the code doesn't compile, it doesn't build, or you end up with a kernel panic, and QE is just frustrated because clearly the developers didn't test their code. Uh, and I touched upon before, it isn't really conducive to having teams work together. Yeah, when you're just throwing code over the wall, you're not really in a good relationship to, uh, to collaborate on, on the, the product itself. And I found in my experience, it's a poor model for providing feedback to other teams and engineers. Uh, in my experience, when uh, working with other development teams in this model, you rarely get the, hey, thanks for testing this feature, hey, thanks for finding that bug. It's just sort of like everyone's doing their job and focused on the next, uh, the next bit of output they have to generate. And there's really little to no effort to improve this process. You, everyone just keeps doing the same thing over and over again, and the same mistakes are made often, and no, little to no improvement is made. Uh, additionally, these interactions that you do have with other groups is when something is typically when something's on fire, like. There's a, a deadline that's been missed, there's a, a bug that's been found, and you have to release the product. And it, it tends up to be, ends up being like a high stakes, lots of emotion uh, environment where everyone's trying to place blame on the other person, or the other group, I should say. So moving to the present, we're starting to see waterfall models get phased out and Agile's getting phased in. Uh, at Red Hat in particular, where we have a strong 
commitment to doing agile in as many places as possible. Uh, we have an agile architect actually who helps drive that message across all the all the teams. Uh, in this, you know, we end up with in this model we end up with QE and development under the in the same umbrella in the same team. Um, so we end up succeeding or failing together. So everyone's intrinsically linked to the outcome of the product. Uh, if QE does a bad job or if dev does a bad job, net, there is no QE in dev anymore. It's just one team. That team either succeeds, succeeds or fails. And in this model, I think it pr promotes professional growth because you're allowed to work on things that wouldn't typically fall under your purview. Like QE can work on dev tasks. Dev can work on QE tasks. And in some cases, you know, you might own some of the rel-eng process, so you get to work on some of the rel-eng stuff as well. Uh, and also Agile allows you to constantly improve the process so you can look at what happened in the past, make an analysis, suggest changes, try those changes, and then uh, go forward, hopefully for the better. Now when you start practicing Agile, you usually end up practicing DevOps as well. And that's when you know, a team, the team owns all the phases of development or multiple phases of the development. Uh, the, like for example, the actual development test, release, and monitoring. Um, there could be other phases of development in your model, uh, but these are the ones that kind of stick out to me. And this, and this model of owning all the phases, you need to have excellent communication in your team, and you've got to work well together in a team. And this becomes your, th this is like the key point, like you have to have great teamwork in order to succeed in this model. So going in the future, looking to the future, we're probably going to see more agile uh, adoption, more DevOps adoption. We're going to see more automation, autom obviously. Uh, things like continuing integration delivery can become really important, uh, even more important than they are now, because we want to be able to move faster and produce software that's uh, higher quality at the same, same time. And I threw in this because everyone's talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I haven't seen this in practice yet in the QE space, but it's probably going to happen. I can imagine someone writing something that would analyze test results and can figure out commonly, uh, commonly found bugs or errors or whatnot. And obviously, what I'm here to, uh, to emphasize is going to be a lot more teamwork. You've got to have good teamwork to be successful going forward, much like they did in Anchorman. So, uh, I'm going to talk about what I think, what I describe as a highly functional team. Uh, I don't know if I read this or I made it up myself, but it's a team that works well together. It's able to solve problems together and achieve your goals together consistently. And you're not going to do that every week or every day or whatever, but overall, you have a really highly functional unit of, of uh, people. And one of the, the cornerstones of this, I think, is open communication. Uh, you need to be able to talk to your team members completely honestly and let them know what's happening in, inside the team and with the product itself. Uh, and to do that, you should really, everyone on the team should feel respected and show respect to the other people on the team. And this breeds a, a uh, an environment where no one's afraid to uh, share an opinion or share some feedback that might be controversial because they know they're not gonna get judged when they make that, that, uh, that statement. I also think everyone on the team should have a confidant because you're not always going to want to just go to your team of eight or ten people and say, hey, this is what I think we should do because maybe you're a little wary about how it's going to sound. You should be able to go to somebody on your team, whether it's an architect or a senior team lead or um, a scrum master, for example, and say, here's the idea I have. How do you think I should phrase it? How do you think I should uh, present it to the team? And that just having that person to bounce ideas off of like can really help boost your confidence and like get over the hump of feeling scared to talk to your team with uh, what might be controversial opinion. Another cornerstone, I think, is appreciation. I think overall in this industry, we do a really bad job of showing appreciation for each other. Um, we should be able to tell people that, hey, you, what you did is important, what you did has value. And again, that breeds that environment where everyone's starting to feel like they're part of the overall team and they're, they're, they're part of the overall success of the product, of the software development process. Um, even a simple thing like, thanks for finding that bug or thanks for you know updating the Jira ticket. Like, that's just like common courtesy, but we seem to, to forget to do that uh, in our day-to-day -day jobs. 
And when you get that kind of feedback, especially from someone in a senior position, like an architect or someone that's above you or someone you have more respect for, like that can really improve your day and improve your whole experience on the team. And this kind of goes into this, uh, this picture, which if you haven't seen before, it's called uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It was proposed by a psychologist named Abraham Maslow in 1943 in a book he wrote. And it, it shows that we can, to reach self-actualization, and in, the, in software development terms, this means like being able to take, uh, be creative with your solutions, be creative with your problem solving, and taking risks, et cetera. So in software development, we, we probably mostly have our basic needs covered, food, water, security, safety, Hopefully those are covered when you're working. Like if not, then reevaluate what you're doing. Uh, uh, well, you know, if the food court's closed, there's Uber Eats or something, you know. <laughs> but what I talk about when I talked about everyone feeling valued and being uh, respectful and whatnot, that really keys it falls into the psychological needs. So. The person, like it says here, esteem needs, prestige, and feeling of accomplishment. Like when you get that feedback from your team saying you're doing a great job, thank you for doing that. Like that, that helps you fill that that hierarchy. And then the relationships uh, that you build on your team fills that piece of the hierarchy. So then you can go once you have those those uh, uh, those needs addressed in your team, then you can go and take those risks, offer those controversial opinions, take some creative. Uh, uh, chances with the software that you're working with. So how do we get there? How do we get to this highly functional team where everyone's owning the process, everyone's concerned with software quality? Uh, number one, you have to nurture the creation of relationships within your team. Uh, you don't have to be best friends with everyone, but you should be friendly with them. You should feel like they're a peer that you can talk to, that you can interact with, and treat them with the respect and value that I mentioned earlier. I think it's also important to meet in person at least once a year, uh, especially here at Red Hat, well not here, but at Red Hat we have, uh, we have a lot of teams that have remote workers. On the team I have, for example, I work on, for example, there's people in Westford, Massachusetts, in Raleigh, in San Francisco, Toronto, and then some folks even in Europe. So it's really difficult to get everyone in place uh, once a year, but if you can, it allows you to build those relationships I talk about uh, in such a m much more deeper and more meaningful way, uh, because you just just the, the value of hum human interaction is like, I mean, I can't I can't put more emphasis on it, um, and that's just in the workplace itself. Like once you're done with the work, then you go out to dinner, then you go out and have drinks, and you get to figure out uh, more about the persons that you're working with. And I think that is gonna help you in the long term uh, have a more successful team. Uh, if you're practicing Agile, I think you should utilize those Agile activities like in-person stand-ups or video stand-ups. Uh, I find that just seeing the faces of the people I work with on video conference, because we are all remote, is you know, reinforces like, hey, there's another person on the other side of the world that is depending on me to do my job correctly, and vice versa, they're depending on uh, uh, me to do my job as well. Um, if you can do in-person stand-ups, like, that's even better, because you do get that immediate face-to-face -face, uh, feedback. And in Agile, we have the concept of retrospectives, where we talk about what we did in the last sprint, the last period of time, and we talk about what, we, what went well, what didn't go well, and fi we figure out how we can improve the process to get closer to like a real, the, the, the best we can be. And the closer we get to the best we can be, clearly we're gonna get better quality software out of it. Uh, and like I said before, give feedback to your team. Celebrate your achievements that your team has made. You know, whether it's on social media or on email or whatever, say, t talk about how the, what this person did in their in their job in the sprint or whatnot. Uh, suggest your improvements when things don't work out. Don't don't hold back. I mean, do it respectfully, clearly, but you, you need to keep giving that feedback to improve the team a, as a whole and show gratitude. I mentioned before, like just saying thank you for things that happen every day uh, really go the different go the distance I think especially if you do it consistently and finally remember we're all human we all have the same not the same but we all have similar dreams hopes feelings desires treat other people like they're human they're not just another face on the screen or whatnot or a you know email address on your in your inbox 
So once you have, let's say you have your highly functional team and it's, and it's running well, now you need to start putting your feelers out beyond your team. Uh, to Again, to spread the word of how software quality is important to everybody and how it's all their responsibility. So this is when you need to get the non-development, non-QE people involved. Bring in people like tech writers, program managers, support engineers, community managers. Get them to participate in your development process. Let them provide feedback to you, and let and let and provide feedback to them as well. Like maybe the support engineers aren't uh, as timely with contacting you with critical information, the, the need for critical information. So we can talk to them about that. How can we improve that process? Or uh, for example, program managers, we can talk about how maybe they're not generating requirements that are specific enough or, or whatnot, but get everyone participating on the process. And again, use the same guidelines I, I've talked about before in terms of respect and gratitude and whatnot. So now you've got a highly functional team, core team. You've started to build relationships with external teams. Now we can start to leverage the strength that we've built with the core team and the external teams. This is when you can really start to talk about making quality uh, uh, everyone's job. Um, so you get involved in the development process as soon as possible. In the waterfall model, you saw how the, the requirements planning happens at the very beginning. How many people have participated in requirements planning as a QB engineer for some piece of software? I mean, I know I haven't, honestly. Uh, I don't know if you have, then you're doing, the good, you're doing a good job. Uh, well done, Adam. <laughs> but I, I think that, that we're missing that a lot from the, from the industry. Uh, and this kind of goes into the, this V model. So the V model shows on the left-hand side, we've got the software development process, starting with the requirements planning down to architecture, design, and implementation. And on the right side, we have the testing and validation uh, portion of the model. And you can notice that each for each piece of development, uh, whether it's requirements, architecture, or design, we have a test uh, corollary. So each one of these testing pieces has the ability to validate what was generated on the other side. Um, and again, like I said, I don't follow my advice. I, I'm very bad at following my own advice, so I'm not even close to being this this good. If you're if you're operating at this level, my hat's off to you because it, it does require a lot of work. It does require a lot of teamwork, and but this should be the goal we're striving for. You should be striving to have tests that are able to validate each piece of the left hand side of the model. Ah, that didn't work. Okay, so. I wanted all those to come out sequentially, but I guess my edit was wrong. So, yeah. Well, I guess I'm doing a bad job. <laughs> so, like I said, uh, so in terms of getting involved, attend these decision-making meetings if you can, if they'll allow you to get in there. And even if you can just get in there and listen, you can get a feel for you know where the direction the product's going, and then alter your, your how figure out how you're going to test this product down the line. Um, understand the business needs that are being met, understand the use cases, and start asking questions about how this software is going to be tested. And if you can do that at these early stages, at the planning stages, the requirement stages, then you can maybe uncover problems in the requirements that will be impossible to test. Um, I, don't have a good example of it, but you can imagine what a requirement that would be come down from product management, and then when QE gets it finally at the end of the, you know, at the bottom of the model, if they're not involved, they're like, I, I don't know how to test this. Like, there's no possible way. I don't have a million man hours to do this. Um, and start to plan your development test tasks together. And this is one, this is another uh, point where I'm, I'm not doing as good a job as I should in our, on our team. Um, but if you can plan that, that development piece of work and then side by side plan how you're going to test that and develop them in parallel, then you're going to be able to pick out the bugs in the software a lot earlier than if the development finishes first and then three weeks later QE picks it up and says, oh, I'm going to write some tests for it. You're going to miss bugs. And then when you get involved with development to fix these bugs, they're going to say, well, why didn't you catch this earlier? And that sort of thing. And if you do that, you'll have Success Kid to show for it. So to wrap up, waterfall model is bad. Agile is better if you're doing it properly. Um, you got to live or die together as a team. Like 
that's the whole, I think that's one of the key points of the Agile model. Um, practice that open communication, be, be open with your feedback, be honest with your feedback. Oh, look at that, it goes right into my next point, honest feedback. Uh, and strive to include those external teams, get their feedback because they have a different perspective on the software development process than, than you might, and that's going to ultimately grow your team as a, uh, to be more successful. And like I said, get involved early and often, ask questions, and try to catch the problems that we're going to face as QE uh, as early as possible. And that's it. So does anybody have any questions, comments? No? Great. Go, go do good. Thank you, everybody. I have a question, actually. All right. I need to think about it. Um, it's kind of open-ended, but I'm just curious of your thoughts. So just, so my situation, I work on Fedora, right? Yep. Which is, it's, it's interesting because it's not a product. It doesn't have a development process, right? So yeah. people, people think about, hey, how do we make Fedora do Agile? And it's kind of, it's, it's yeah. I was in, in thinking about situations like operating systems, Fedora, RHEL, whichever, you're working on very complex interlocking products which don't have a single development team, a single development model. Yeah. How do you apply these practices to those, do you think? Yeah, that's, so in case, I'll repeat it just for the recording in case it wasn't caught, but Adam's asking, uh, in the Fedora ecosystem, you know, there's many different development teams, many different developers, how do you pre apply these uh, tactics to that model? Um, you know, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with how Fedora operates now. Like, you just got to, I mean, I know you, Adam, you, you reach out to everybody, right? You try to be respectful. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you try. You try. You're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. You're trying to talk to them and get them involved. You're obviously not going to be able to deploy Agile across the entire Fedora you know, system. But I think just trying to get to that, that, that personal side of things, like being honest and respectful and showing gratitude towards these these developers they're going to start to come around and start to interact with you more and then you can have a better dialogue of like well you know your code sucks well, not that you shouldn't say that but you know <laughs> your code has some issues let's say um maybe we can talk about how to improve that or we can talk about what kind of tests we can write to catch the regression we've seen or the problems we've seen um i don't think there's a really good answer to that because it's Number one, I'm not an expert. I said that earlier. Um, I, but I think, I bet you if you talk to one of the agile practitioners in Red Hat, they might have some ideas for you. Um, you know, since you work for Red Hat, you could talk to uh, Jen Krieger. Yeah. She's the architect. She might have an idea. So. Yeah, no, I, I, like you say, there isn't an easy answer. It's yeah. just an interesting thing to think about. And you have to about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just start with being like, Start at the bit at the bottom, like just be nice, be be a, be a good person, you know, and encourage that sort of that that sort of behavior. I think, you know, as humans, when we see, we tend to mirror the behavior we see. I mean, I have two kids, and I know that they're basically a mirror of every mistake I've made and every good thing I've done. So, it's sort of a human nature thing. Even as adults, we're, we mirror what we see. So, if you're being nice to somebody, they're more likely to be nice to you, and then you can start to have those dialogues. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I have a question, too, I guess. Yes. So, I mean, I agree with everything that you said, and... Oh, yeah, hold on. Yeah, so, I agree, with, I agree with everything that you said, mm -hmm. but I noticed that a lot of times it seems that the success rate is much higher when you have QE and development together, mm -hmm. but the other teams, especially PM, for example, it's really hard to get them on board. Yeah. So do you have any advice for improving that? Yeah, I mean, you need, I think in those types of, in that sort of scenario where you have those external teams that haven't bought in, you need to get, I would suggest probably getting your management involved and having them reach out to the other side and say, you know, this is what we're driving towards, this is what we wanted. We want everyone on board with uh, ensuring software quality. And outside of that, like I said, maybe you can drop in on our meetings, you know, reach out to them. I know, for example, on my team, my program manager is Ben Briard. And I've got a pretty decent relationship with him. Like I can reach out to him and ask questions. And the only reason, I, and the only way we did that is that you know he dropped in the office. I was in the same place. 
we said hello, we introduced each other, and we just started talking like people, you know? And then now I've got this open line of communication to him where I can say like, what does this product requirement mean? Like, what are you intending for this, you know? Or do you think we're going in the right direction with the development choices we made, that kind of thing? Um, so it, like I said, it really starts with just those personal relationships. And if you can't establish that personal relationship, then I think you have to involve your management and get your management to bridge that gap uh, uh, ahead of time. Easier said than done, I know. But that, that's the best, the best advice I can give you. You're welcome. Anything else? Nope. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I know it's early, and uh, have a good rest of the conference.